you're about to meet a jack of all trades. I mean, literally a jack of all trades. You speak, we listen. Conversations connecting people. This is the Chuck Williams Show. Welcome back to another edition of the Chuck Williams Show. We'll get right into it. Our guest today is Jack Rogers. Jack is the Director of Emergency Medicine for Piedmont Columbus Regional. I get that right? Emergency Services. Emergency Service. Director of Emergency Services for Piedmont Columbus Regional. Sorry about that. Uh, Welcome, Jack. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, you walked into the WRBL studios today, and uh, you're not a stranger to this place. Oh, are. man, so many memories come flooding back. Um, I walked in, and and obviously the first thing that kind of caught my eye was this lobby is twice the size it used to be <laughs> because it literally was a shoebox. There was a, a, a secret room in the middle that never got used. It was a cut through going somewhere. So I'm guessing they took that wall out and just made the lobby bigger, but uh, – yeah, to walk through the halls and, golly, even after 20 years, seeing some familiar faces still in the building, it's uh, it's awesome to walk back in here. Before you were a nurse, you worked here. Uh, you were, tell us what you did. Yeah, so uh, I did a little bit of everything um, just to kind of kind of set the table for you. Isn't when, that the way it is with TV? You do a little bit of everything in, the, in this industry. Oh, you have to, especially at this market level. Um, you know, one of the things that a lot of my friends – while I was working in the TV business would, would get on me about is, man, you, you get paid to go all of these games and do this and this. And it's what, like, no, I'm not a network. I'm not ESPN. So I don't sit here and just talk to people while everybody else does the busy work. I was the busy work. Um, camera a lot of stuff camera on like, your shoulder on the oh, sidelines at oh. Jordan hair or Kinnett or wherever, man, uh, you know, I, I'll be just absolutely honest with you. This job allowed me to do some absolutely cool things that most people will never get to do in their lifetimes. Uh, but that was just part of the job. It was work. It wasn't a prop your feet up, drink a Coke and eat a hot dog while everything's going on. You're doing the work of the coverage, um, to be able to bring that back home. Uh, our big focus was even on some of the bigger events, the masters, super bowls, world series, things like that was to find a local tie in there and bring that back home. That's where we were different than everybody else. You can watch highlights from games, you know, all over the place, but you can't see those backstories everywhere. And, you know, when you talk about a national event like the Masters, you got the ultimate tie because you were around when Larry won. Larry Mize won it, right? Well, I was uh, – Larry and I go even further back than that. My first job out of high school or in high school was uh, – at Baskin Robbins in Cross Country Plaza, Larry's parents were the owner of that store. <laughs> so I got to meet Larry as he's graduating from Georgia Tech and going to Q School uh, to, to, qualify. Get his, to qualify for the tour and get his card. Yeah, absolutely. And was there for the ride. So you, so you knew Larry before Larry was a Masters champion. Absolutely. You know, one of the cool things, and we're going to get into the medicine part. We really are. But in, I'm a recovering sports guy as well. I mean, I spent a lot of time as sports editor and – a writer over at the Ledger and other papers throughout Alabama, and you know, we're both fairly same age. How old are you? Fifty-seven. Okay, I'm sixty-one. A little bit ahead of, ahead of you in the game, but as you go through life and you do things other than sports, you know, you kind of get out of the toy shop and grow up. Do you always carry what you learn on? you know, in that sports job, the deadlines, the ability to make deadlines, the pressure, and the fun. I mean, the sports is a, fu- is a fun job, but it's a hard job, as you alluded to a minute ago. Yeah, it is. And I think the, the take-home message, the life lesson from all of the work that I did in sports is uh, organization. Just, just to sit back and look at the big picture, not just the fact that here's a game that needs to be covered. How are we going to break this down? what's involved, what do we want to get out of this, what do we want our viewers to see from this, and then be able to put it together in time to get it cleanly on the air. Um, One of the biggest compliments I ever got uh, from a professional level, uh, either profession, uh, was from my dad. My dad in 2000. A great man, a great man. Well, thank you. I kind of like him. We, Uh, We go way back. I go way back with him, too. I used to cover him when he was a city councilor. Yeah, so... He had the opportunity to attend the Major League All-Star Game with me in 2000 when it was in Atlanta. Uh, And that was Tim Hudson's rookie year. 
that was the year he was pitching for the A's. You know, he went on to become the fastest pitcher um, to 100 wins in Major League history at the time. Uh, just a great, great guy and a, and a great year. But uh, National event, <clears throat> local story. Yeah, absolutely. So that was obviously our, our big focus right there. But um, working in the market here in Columbus, um, we didn't have the toys that a lot of other stations had, the satellite trucks and all the other things. You, you know, all the technology for today where you just pop a box that translates something into this, which sees a digital this and comes <laughs> down over here. You know, we didn't have any of that. It was literally you had to have a satellite truck somewhere. We didn't have one. You know, we didn't, we didn't need one enough to be able to justify the cost of one of those. But we were part of a, uh, a network of stations that there were a couple of satellite trucks available in, in the family so we got to borrow the truck out of the mobile area uh, with the caveat that, they, that we would have to do some, some stories for them just as a payback. So we agreed to do that. So the day of the game comes, and uh, I told my dad, all right, I want you to be ready at, uh, at 5.30. He said, 5.30, the game starts at 8. I said, no, 5.30 a.m. So we <laughs> had to get on the road, drive the truck to Atlanta, pull it up, and this was at Turner Field, obviously, at the time. Uh, we had to park the truck, get it staged, run cables, have everything set up so that when it was time to do the work, we could come back to, to edit and, and do what we needed to. Um, but in getting that done, then we had to stop and focus. We had two crews up there, one tagging along to the National League side, one to the American League side. And then we, we divvied up some story ideas, kind of bouncing things off of each other. And as we finished that planning section, we had maybe half an hour to stop and, and grab a bite to eat real quick. But after that, players started showing up. So then we had our separate ways, and, and we're doing our thing with an agreement to meet back at 4 o'clock so we could now just start slamming stuff together and have it ready for the newscast. Well, newscast meant uh, the 6 p.m. news you know, here locally. But for the mobile market, we had to do live stuff for them at their 6 p.m. time frame, 7 p.m. our time, which pushes us even closer to, to game time uh, to get that work done. So by the time we got all that done, we got finished. We had a chance to grab a box dinner really quick and eat it while we're walking to seats in the left field stands. We got to watch two innings of the game before we had to be back in the tunnel by the locker rooms so we could figure out what we're doing in each locker room, pull that together, post-game press conferences, and then throw it all together for the, the live newscast at the end. By the time we got done with all that, wrapped the truck up, had it packed, loaded, headed back home, it was 2.30 in the morning we got back. Um, my dad, after sleeping that off for two days, told me, he said, I will, I will never be more in awe of what you do after living through that one day uh, because people don't see that side of it, and that, no. was, that was a huge compliment. It, that is a huge compliment, and, you know, those days, I mean, I've covered games in Gainesville and Columbia, South Carolina, and driven home after, you know, after a 4.30 mm -hmm. or whatever game, and, you know, and it's a long day, but it's it's worth it. Let's transition. So how do you go from being a sports guy, a really good sports guy, and, and this is somebody who watched you back in the day, to becoming – a nurse. How do you make that career transition? So there was a point um, where I did a little bit of juggling going back and forth from TV to radio for a short time uh, and then back into TV. And that time that I was doing radio, there was a little gap between the end of the radio job and the next TV job. Rewind very quickly to you know some previous experience while doing news. And, and at that point, as a news photographer on the street, chasing fire trucks, ambulances, police cars, I got to know some really good guys with the fire department. One of those was actually a new EMT instructor, and he, for a long time, had been trying to get me to take one of his classes. And I finally had the opportunity at that point. I think it was more of a just shut him up and, and move on kind of thing, uh, but ended up falling in love with it. Just the, the thought that you can do something when somebody's in potentially their worst moment ever to make a difference in their life, and that's, that's, that's kind of cool. So you went in through the EMT EMT route into nursing. So you've got your EMT cer uh, certification, then went and got your RN. Yeah, EMT to paramedic. I spent, uh, actually spent a gap of about three and a half to four years working full time for the fire department here, uh, riding as a paramedic. 
Um, and then, and you could do that and the TV job. You were able because the shift work to do a little bit. To do yeah, that. yeah. And <laughs> it, it's funny because people, you know, when you're riding on the ambulance, you walk in, they they kind of look at you funny. It's like I know you, but I don't know you. <laughs> and one guy just, I remember, called one night uh, south end of town. One guy just kept staring at me, wouldn't stop. And uh, I kind of f- had a feeling he figured out what was going on. Well, it just happened in my wallet to have some of my TV station business cards. So on our way back to the truck, I just kind of coincidentally dropped one. And as I, my partner climbed in the back of the truck with a patient, I climbed up front to drive, uh, rolled the window down, was about to pull off, and saw that he had found the car, picked it up, he looked at it, he said, I knew it was you. I knew it was you. That was, that was no, classic. With no disrespect intended, if you're laying there after a car wreck, and all of a sudden the sports guy shows up as your EMT, Got to be a little worried. Well, I mean, just as worried <laughs> as those people that watch the uh, TV ads after a car record and you hear one call, that's all, or, you uh, know, you don't want those kind of guys uh, hanging over you. Obviously, you probably don't want a TV personality hanging over you when you when you need help medically. Let me ask you about that. You obviously have been a photographer on the scene, mm-hmm. you know, whether it be homicide or something like that. Or, or a bad car wreck. You've been that photographer. And this is a stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What's the difference in being there as a journalist and being there as someone who's trying to help save somebody's life? Being there as a journalist, I think you have to take into account that there is some modicum of respect, even under the circumstances, that you have to show not just to the victim and the family, but the circumstances. You don't show bodies. You don't do a dinner. There's correct, correct. I mean, you might show a wide shot of a scene that's got a body that's covered, yeah. but but the body really is kind of lost in the minutia of all the other moving parts behind it all. Um, you know, I, I've seen news coverage where people would, you know, tight shots of, of bodies with a hand hanging out from under uh, a blanket or a sheet or funerals that were shot with tight shots of the body in the casket and things like that. And that just, that just didn't fly well with me. It doesn't fly reason. well with me. Either. No. And so, I, you know, that just from the, the respect standpoint, um, and, and you got to think about it too. You know, what do your, your pictures have to match at that point? I wasn't writing stories, uh, but your pictures have to match what you anticipate that reporter is going to be writing. And, or the anchor is going to be reading. Correct. And, and I never thought that somebody was going to read something that would absolutely make it necessary for me to put a sh- tight shot of a body in, in what we did. So, you know, it was just kind of a, a, a workflow of my own that I adopted. Now, fast forward to being on the scene, literally, you know, working on working on the victim. So, looking through the eyes of the camera, you are you're kind of removed from the emotion of the situation in most cases. Uh, working medically, you're right there in the middle of it. You're experiencing everything that patient is, uh, and if family has to be close by, you're having to deal with the emotions that they're going through as well. So you have to learn how to to feel the emotion, but not let it affect the way you work, uh, because you want to you want to be uh, empathic. Uh, you want to show you know courtesy and respect to the family. But you also know there's a piece of you that needs to be very blunt uh, and educative, uh, if that's a word. Um, yeah, so you can you telling can be people their options between. and stuff. What's yeah, coming? You, yeah, you know when a family walks in, especially and and this is a great culture in nursing now. Is you know back in the days when uh, people would have heart stop, stop breathing. Uh, that code room is the sanctuary for the staff. No visitors allowed. Family stay out. Friends stay out. Uh, but we've we've seen a big culture shift in the last generation. I would say uh, that it's okay to let the family come in because uh, two reasons. Number one, um, family wants to be there to see that we're doing the very best job that we can at taking care of their loved one. When and, and I've had this happen on several occasions. Some even with children, which are much harder to deal with emotionally. Um, but to uh, to do everything that you absolutely can with a family standing there watching and then a family member walk up and put their hand on the child's foot and said, that's enough. It's time to stop. And they make that decision. We don't. Um, I think family... Is there, is, there, is there a comfort in that for... 
you know, because you're going to do all you can do till you can do no more. We think in our heads from a, a clinical standpoint, at some point there's going to have to be a, a decision to stop. Whether it's, you know, we have a good outcome, pulse comes back, they start breathing, or even if they're not breathing on their own, they're on a ventilator, they're more stable than they were, uh, then yes, we, we stop at that point. We know we back up. You know, that's the best we can do at that point. And, you know, and get we, them to the next level. Get them to that, absolutely, get them to the next level. Uh, if the outcome is not going to be good, um, a lot of times if emotion kind of takes over, we're going to push. We're going to go a lot farther than science typically tells us. If you go this long doing these things uh, and nothing's changed at that point, that would be your, your next decision point now. Do we stop? Do we not? But we continue to kind of push through just with the hope that – we can do something, regardless of what it is, we can do something to help that family have a good outcome with this patient. You come out of a culture of wins and losses, the sports culture. I mean, there's winners and losers in everything. When the winner and loser is life and death, how much harder is that? That's a great question. I don't think I've ever heard it phrased like that. I, I think of it this way, Chuck. Um, and, and probably the biggest reason for the switch in careers uh, is when you do a good job working in the broadcast industry, you get some plaques, you get a couple of trophies. You may you get know, an Emmy. Yeah, you might. Uh, nominated for two. Thank you. Um, but uh, not lucky enough to have uh, the trophy yet. Um, but anyway, you, you get a you get something to take home to put on your mantle and look at from time to time. When you do a good job medically with a patient that things kind of look grim uh, and you have a good outcome, you get to walk away the satisfaction that you had a small part in the care of a patient that now gets to go home and potentially spend more time with their family that they wouldn't have had before. What does that feel like? That's a good feeling when you know you've worked your tail off to do everything the right way. And sometimes thinking outside the box, maybe, you know, unconventionally, uh, to do what we can with what we have to work with. And when you get a good outcome, it's, it's something to celebrate. Flip side of that, when you don't get the outcome, that can be devastating. I was going to ask, I mean, the other side of it's got to be incredibly difficult, and it's hard. I can't imagine not taking it home with you. You can't. Um, that's one of the, the topics right now uh, in nursing in general is how do you cope? How do you deal, especially with what we've gone through over the last two-plus years with COVID? Um, and a lot, of, a lot of nurses have a lot of different things that they do. Uh, resilience is a big topic. Uh, almost to the point now to um, where it's offensive to nurses uh, because... I don't understand what you're saying. So <clears throat> a lot of comments come from a survey that was done by uh, the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, uh, and this was in the last six months or so. They put out a survey um, looking specifically at resilience and what we as a profession can do to, to support... Uh, bedside nurses to help them feel better about the jobs that they're doing and make it not as difficult to come back to work for that next shift. Uh, and I think that term resilience has kind of been thrown around so loosely that it doesn't mean anything to anybody anymore. Nurses have always thought that, well, I was already resilient. I would go work a 12-hour shift, just get slammed, and then turn around and walk back in the door for the next one. So That's uh, resilience. You know? So using your sports metaphor it's a cliche it's become a cliche it has it has absolutely so we're looking at um, you know probably some even though we're talking about the same concept is is the verbiage around that needs to change a little bit so nurses feel more supported than they do smacked at a little bit by just throwing around that quote cliche what's your favorite sports cliche oh golly um, I'm, I'm gonna say there, there are so I mean, you came them. from okay Bruce, uh, what was Bruce? Bruce Snyder. Bruce Snyder was. See ya. Every time somebody hit a home run. Yeah. See ya. I mean, obviously, Platt has been in, was in this market, you know, longer than dirt. I mean, what was your catchphrase? I don't, I never had one. I never wanted one. 
You didn't want a catchphrase? Mm-mm. No, I I wanted, and, and just my twisted way of thinking, I didn't want to be known for a phrase. I wanted to be known for the work that I did. You know, and if you can't recognize me and the work that I do through my storytelling and the way I put things together, uh, I, you don't need to be in a business just for a catchphrase. And you were doing this during the whole ESPN. Everything was a catchphrase. Mm-hmm. Cool is the other side of the pillow. Yeah. I mean, which is still my favorite one. Uh, was That was Stuart Scott, wasn't it? It was cool. It was, yep. Um. That's interesting that you didn't want to boil when people said Jack Rogers to boil it down to one sentence or one phrase. Well, you know, and and I take that from conversations that I had with friends of mine and some other people that I met in the community. You know, they would always, um, I hate to admit this, and and Dave would laugh at it, but people always got me and Plata confused. (laughs) They would look at me and, you know, call me Dave Plata. Uh, they would look look at Dave and say, "You're that guy from Channel 3. and you know would would, would mix it up and you know, which one of y'all took that as a compliment? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it, it's funny because everybody always considered us to be competition. We worked at stations that competed for everything, you know, against each other. Uh, but we were more friends than we were competitors. We shared a lot of information. We did a lot of things together we went through the same things together and doing the job that we do. So there was a mutual respect there and it turned into a friendship. Funny, funny Plata story. His son drew Plata, uh, who I've known since he was a baby in the press box, his works here. And I have drew and Dave's numbers, both in my cell phone. And yesterday this happens about once a month. I was calling drew to see if a graphic was ready. And I called Dave, and Dave just picks up the phone and goes, no, Chuck, the graphic is not ready yet. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm calling Dave, and Dave knows it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bad out. But Dave and Drew, it's just, I see, I see the D, and I just start hitting the button. So, so, so another funny Dave story. Um, Dave was new to the market in 1985. Uh, I was here from 85 to 87 at uh, RBL. Uh, but left RBL, did the little radio thing we talked about for a short while, and I moved over to to TVM uh, in the position of 11 p.m. news producer. Uh, So I got to know Dave a little better that, but we we weren't, you know, friends yet. We were just still kind of learning each other. Well, it's it's time for the Georgia-Auburn football game, and there's a bakery in town that made some cookies uh, in the shape of animals, one decorated in red and black, one decorated in orange and blue, had an A on it, had a G on it. For those of you who don't know, Dave's got another son named Jeffrey. It's spelled starting with a G. Dave looks at the cookies. He says, oh, how sweet. One for Andrew, one for Jeffrey. <laughs> I said, don't think so, Dave. That's probably Auburn in Georgia. <laughs> what it actually, works. It works. This is going to be a question that goes to both the the – TV side of it, but the medical side. Is it an advantage or a disadvantage to do what you do in your hometown? I think from a TV standpoint, it can be because, because it's a disadvantage. Oh, wow. Yeah, just because you never get downtime. Uh, and, and I'm talking about outside of the job. Uh, I couldn't go to the store without somebody – you know, following me. Um, For those of you who have been around for a long time in this area, when the Gaylord store used to be up on Hamilton Road off of, (laughs) off of, uh, it It shows you how far back. Yeah. It was pretty close to the Lewis Jones up there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, It was on one side of Manchester Expressway and Lewis Jones was on the other. But my wife and I were in there uh, one Sunday afternoon, um, just kind of browsing through the store, killing some time. Uh, and noticed there were two older ladies who would kind of look up our direction and then would start talking and they'd go another way. And there were three or four episodes where, where that happened in the store. And finally, as we exit onto a main aisle and start back towards the front of the store, one of those ladies comes up, gets right in my face, and starts hollering to her friend, Look, Ethel, look, I told you it was him. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you would always get that, hey, I know you, hey, I know you. So it's it's almost one of those, you never get to be off stage. 
and that's you know, and just kind of relax a little bit. There was always that, you know, somebody's looking and they're going to say. You know, in the last three years, I've modified some of my, I mean, I'm more cognizant when I'm out because at the newspaper, you know, you were a byline. I mean, people knew your byline. Right. The people that were power players in town knew who you were because you dealt with them a lot. And some of the readers knew you. But for in the three years since I've switched over to TV, it's amazing how many people in this community recognize me. And I have one thing you didn't have when you were on there here. I'm the only guy in this market with this voice. And there's a reason for that. I mean, nobody else has this voice in the Columbus market. And it's not a radio voice. It's, I mean, you know, it's not a TV voice. It's, it's, it's what God gave me and I can't do much about it. And my voice is recognizable. People recognize me two aisles over at family dollar because they hear me and go, oh, there's the newsman. And it is, it's, you know, it's cool to be recognized, but you really got to be on your P's and Q's when you want to get mad at a clerk because they've messed something up or something. You can't do it. I get it. You know, and I kind of liken what you're going through, what you just said to Marty Smith up at ESPN. Yeah. Marty's not your traditional broadcast voice. He's just a, just a good old down-home fellow who fell in love with TV and decided to chase his dream, and he's done very well. It's about content, and it's about reporting. Right. You, and, and, you know, it's interesting. That's where we are. Let's go back to the emergency medical side of this. We're about half hour into this, and I want, I want to be respectful of your time. But go back. You've just been appointed to a national emergency medical board. Yeah, so I've been uh, been very fortunate to be involved with the Emergency Nurses Association since 2008. Um, it's a professional organization aimed at supporting emergency nurses and helping to develop best practice resources to support them so they uh, can train well and do their jobs well. Um there's a lot of a lot of other things that the organization does, but primarily just you know supporting uh, emergency nurses as a whole. Uh, I got involved thanks to an administrator uh, at the facility I was working at at the time who said, "Hey, we've uh, we've been given permission to send a few people to an educational conference. Want to know if you'd like to go?" Um, and I figured if our company sending us to a conference, it's probably a one day road trip to Atlanta to sit for four or five hours listen to some people talking, and drive right back home. And they say, oh, no, 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 Salt Lake City, Utah, all expenses paid. So, whoo, road trip. So let's see what this is all about. And, you Ball know, game. <laughs> you know, yeah, really. So you know, the, the thing that really kind of struck me um, walking in the door was the fact that there were 6,000 ER nurses from around the country in that convention center, and every stinking one of them, went through the same thing that I go through every day at work. Is that a good – is that somehow comforting to be in a room full of use? Very much so. You know, when you're kind of isolated in your own organization and think, golly, why can't we do any better doing this? Why don't things go well when we try this? You know, there are other people from around the, uh, the country that have been through the same thing and come up with different types of solutions to problems and answers like that. So – the networking has been huge for me, just reaching out and seeing what other people do in other parts of the country to see if there's anything we can learn to make us better here at home. That that translates, I mean, if you're a patient here, that translates into best practices, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Getting somebody is, somebody in Ogden, Utah may be doing something different than you are here in Columbus, Georgia, and it's transferable. And, and during that trip to Salt Lake City, we did get a chance to tour the ER of one of their bigger hospitals out there. Uh, and got some very good friends that work out there now, and we still, to this day, stay in contact on a kind of a personal basis to talk about work, to talk about uh, trends, uh, you know, comparing what's COVID done where you are. Well, here's what we're going through, and just kind of bouncing things off of each other. So when you do that, you stepped into a larger role with the organization now, and that's taken, what, I guess 13, 14 years. You're going to be traveling a lot this year, and you're going to be heavily involved in the national side of it, right? Yeah, so one of, I, I was elected in September to serve on the board of directors for the national organization for the next three years. Um, That's a commitment. Part of the reason for wanting to do that was just getting to a point in my career where it's, it's time to pay it forward. 
to give other people the opportunity to learn from some of the things that I've been able to accomplish and some of the struggles that I've had that I've leaned on others to help overcome. One of the programs that the organization provided early in, in my membership uh, was was called the Eminence Program. And basically, at, at the time I went through, it was a trial program. But they were partnering new members to the organization, and new members were those less than two years. So new blood. Uh, correct. Partnering uh, a select number of, of people in that uh, uh, demographic and partnering them with people that are in their, quote, Nurses Hall of Fame, the uh, Academy of Emergency Nurses. A mentorship program. Right, absolutely. That's exactly what it was. And I got paired up with uh, a nursing instructor from New Jersey who just absolutely blew my socks off. She's a little dynamo, probably all of five foot two, uh, you know, the typical New Jersey grandmother with the accent and all that. But, you know, we really hit it off, and I learned some great things from her the big thing was she helped me to meet some of the other people who have done some great things in the organization. So because I've had the opportunity from mentors in the past pushing me the right direction, it's time for me to, to give to those who are new to the organization now and provide them with the same opportunity. How does the 57-year-old Jack Rogers look at things differently than the 22-year-old kid? The, the easy answer is technology. You wow. know, I, I still, um, I, I consider myself for an older fellow pretty adept at, at dealing with that. And a large part of that is through ENA, through our state organization, I've been the chair of their communications committee for the last five years. And that entails uh, website management, management of social media accounts, you know, that kind of thing. So I kind of had to learn on the fly. Uh, not that I'm great at it, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. Uh, the younger generation of nurses, I mean, they grew up with that stuff. I mean, it's it's second nature. All of them are using cell phones mm -hmm. right now. And everybody's I mean, looking up like that. Are you talking about me? Yeah. Um, but but that's just, I mean, good or good, bad or indifferent. That's just the the difference between the two generations. So, you know, I can offer from my standpoint, away from technology, what kind of things did we do when I started, and what have I seen? Uh, change from the time that I started, you know, as far as best practices, approaches, medications, uh, situations, illnesses, that kind of thing, and offer a take on what it used to be like and where we are now. Uh, so hopefully people will understand as they're coming out of school right now, walking into, and God bless them, I, I can't imagine how tough it's been, but a large majority of nurses in general over the last couple of years are graduating from nursing school and walking into their first job without ever having put their hands on a real patient because of COVID and because of the desire to keep students from catching something when they're in the hospital. So it's all been simulation labs. Um, and it's difficult walking in. <laughs> ERP, my Columbus patient. Regional, ain't no stimu simulation lab. It's a stimulation lab. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> always, always moving, I tell Did, you. Let me ask you this, and you've kind of touched on it. Does that... Does with the gray hair that you and I have come a responsibility to try to at least model the way it should be done, but also help the younger people? And if you look, this is an entry level TV market. You know, I can't help them on technology, but I mean, they've helped me on technology, but I can show them sort of how to report. I can show them the value of working sources, things like that. What comes on your end with the gray hair? From from my side, I think it needs to be the understanding that there's a partnership here, that I can help you fill in some of the blank areas and in, in your concepts and, and your workflow and how you do things, um, but I can learn things from you as well. Um, yeah. So as long as we go into it with that you know, back and forth exchange, uh, everything, you know, and we talk about constructive criticism and how people really don't like that, but you got to understand from a constructive criticism standpoint, it's a communication, just a feedback loop. It's not personal. It's not attacking anything. But we want to be able to to address concerns um, up front because a concern in TV means your boss is going to yell at you because your package didn't hit the store the story block on time. Or you convicted somebody uh, of a crime. Or you convicted somebody of a crime. Whereas in the ED. You know, not having that conversation and allowing a behavior to continue could mean a bad outcome for a patient. 
One of the things, and I'm, and I'm sure it's the same way in your profession, but I've noticed it now and I've noticed it with my own daughters. The kids of today are way smarter than we were. And I mean, that, I mean, you and I didn't have the technological advantages, but these kids, but we had more personal experience person to person than maybe they did. Do you think that the kids are smarter today than we were? 40 years ago. I, I think so, absolutely, because look what everybody's got in their hands. You know, you've got the world at your fingertips. Hey, we had now. the encyclopedias, buddy. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> but you had to read through the encyclopedia, and that's, you know, it's not snippet form, <laughs> trust me. Um, you know, but, and I'll take this back to my oldest granddaughter, who's 11 now, when she was three years old, staying with my mother in law one afternoon. My mother-in-law called the cable company because she thought something was wrong with the TV, and the cable guy walked in and found the three-year-old programming the VCR to be able to see what she needed to see on the TV. So, yes, absolutely. You know, when you put the technology in their hands and they get used to it from, I mean, I I, I hate to say this, uh, and I don't want anybody to think I'm picking on, you know, the generation or the way people choose to do things with their kids. Um, And and I'm, I'm absolutely just as guilty of this to some level as anybody else would be. But but phones have been a distraction and a babysitter now for some of the younger generation. And yep. I think that's why they're so good with the technology because they're kind of forced from an early uh, early age to sit down and see, okay, watching uh, Coco Melon videos on, on the phone. Well, that translates into, hey, can I have your phone? Turn the phone on, find the right app, click over there, swipe a few places, scroll through what you need, and boom, there's your video. You know, it's more than just push and play and watching a video. Oh, it's, it's thinking through and building that muscle memory, and, you know, you just translate that on. Then you start hitting the Internet. You start doing info searches, and, you know, like I said, the world's at your fingertips now. You have access to any kind of information from anywhere, and, yeah, that, you know, in your formative years where you're learning how to speak a language and do things, throw on top of that now the intellectual piece of that from the, the information flow. Yeah, That's absolutely. Right. I think they're smarter. We'll get into a couple more things, but you just touched on something. Grandparent, obviously. In being a grandparent, so much better than kids. I mean, dealing with grandkids is way better. Than, I heard somebody describe it one day. is kids are the investment. Grandkids are the dividend. I, and I've always heard the good thing about grandkids is you can give them back to their parents when <laughs> you're tired of them. Um, I've I've never been that way. Yeah, you know, I, I know there there's a reason out there that old people weren't meant to take care of really, really little ones. Yeah. Um, I have four but grandchildren. But nine-year-olds, baby. Look, I, give I, me a nine-year-old all day. I've got, I've got four right now, 11, 10, 4, and 3 months. Oh, wow. Love them all dearly. Um, and uh, a couple of them actually live with me. So I don't give them back to anybody. Um, but I look at it as, as a blessing from my standpoint because my dad was originally from Pennsylvania. His family lived up there. I can probably count on one hand the number of times I had any contact with his side of the family in my life um, just because of the distance. Uh, where now I have the opportunity for my grandkids to live with me, and I've built a relationship that is just unbelievable. What do they call you? Pops. I'm Pops. Two Pops is here, man. Uh, you know, do you take them to, to Golden Park to some ball games? Do you, go, do you take do you take them to ball games yet? Look, I'm going to fall on my sword. I I decided when I finally hung it up in TV that I was going to become the fan because I never had a chance to go to things and actually sit and just watch and enjoy. I can probably, again, count on one hand the number of times I've gone to see a hockey game or – uh, you know, something else. So I, I would love to be able to get back into the swing of doing that more often and take them with me. Yeah. It's, it, you know, they, you know, I'm glad Golden Park's coming back with a form of baseball. All Scott Brand and those guys trying to put baseball back in there because Golden Park, oh, I'm going to get in trouble once I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Golden Park is a treasure. And there sh- and live baseball should be played there. I mean, it is, even though you were covering the Astros and others when there just weren't the crowds, but but there's nothing like sitting on a sun on a summer evening watching a baseball game. To me, it's the it's one of the great joys in life. Yeah, you know, I think now if we could drum up enough 
support in the community to work at getting a minor league franchise back here. Now would be the time to do it because of the development of Uptown, uh, the cleanup of some of the areas that, you know, with the, the older rundown buildings and freshening the area up, it's a lot more visitor friendly down in that area. I, I think people, if you put a good product on the field and in the stands, people would want to come back to that area to be able to participate. I used to be exactly where you were. I've changed a little bit watching what the Savannah Bananas have done. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have created essentially a culture there that works with with amateur or with baseball players that aren't exactly affiliated. I think you can make that work, but you've got to be just a bombshell promoter. Yeah, you, know. you, you can. I think you can make that work. I love what I've seen from them, and I'm, I'm excited. That's probably one of the next things I'm going to do is go down to Golden Park when they come here in April. It's, uh, but I've heard all of the stories from folks that I know that live in Savannah and, and go to ball games regularly. Yeah. Um, and seen what they do you know, through some YouTube videos, and, and, and you're right, it's spot on. It's a show, and people want to come for the show. I do think minor league franchises – at the low A ball level like we've been, you know, historically for years. Uh, as long as you can provide that type of show, maybe not necessarily involving the players, but in the atmosphere in the stadium around all of that, then you still have uh, the potential for some success. Two things I want to get at before, and you and I could talk sports all day because at the end of it, at the core, we're both sports guys. We probably always will be. Uh, I wanted to say – What's COVID done to your profession over the last two and a half years? COVID has taken away the ability of the bedside nurse to come in and do what they were primarily trained to do is just provide nursing care for their patients. And when I say nursing care, it's the ability to spend time building a relationship with that patient while they're there. Uh, to be able to answer questions appropriately, to have the time to explain things, to get to know their family, to be able to communicate things. when A they very important piece of the job. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's turned into a generally, it's turned into a task-related uh, profession. You have a list of things you need to do, and you have so many other responsibilities that now uh, you go on with that list of things to do, check mark, check mark, check mark, check mark, I'll be back later, Check mark, check mark, check mark with the next one, and and it's you know rinse, lather, rinse, repeat, lather, rinse, repeat. It's just over and over and over. You don't have the time anymore because of the volumes of patients, uh, the fact that you're, uh, and, and again this again is a a national problem, because your COVID patients tend to when they're hospitalized stay longer periods of time. It causes a, a plug in the system that allows patients to move through. So. Overcrowding in ERs uh, is a big story nationally now, and a lot of that is because inpatient beds are full and there's nowhere else to put them. You told me a story very early in the pandemic. It probably was last April. It was April of 2020 that one of the hardest things you've ever had to do was y'all had a patient that wasn't doing wasn't going to be a good outcome, and the whole family was outside the ER because they couldn't come in the hospital. And you had to go out there and talk to that family, and then they had to make a decision on some stuff. Tell that story if you wouldn't mind. So early in the pandemic, you know, we were still learning about what COVID was and what it could and couldn't do, uh, how we needed to protect ourselves. And, and because there wasn't a lot, a lot of knowledge early on, I think everybody uh, in the medical system just really kind of went overboard with things. We're going to do everything we possibly can to keep us from, from contracting it. Uh, and, and heaven forbid, taking it and giving it to somebody who doesn't have it by contact with them. Uh, but another decision that we made locally, and, and we, we look at this on a regular basis, but early on one of the decisions we made was to restrict visitor access because we didn't want people coming in and catching COVID from somebody that was in the hospital. And this was a situation where this patient was uh, positive for COVID. Uh, we didn't feel it was safe for the family at that time. Uh, and we understand you know, the situation, uh, and it was just gut-wrenching to have to deal with a family who couldn't come in knowing their loved one was dying and wouldn't be able to spend those last few minutes with them. Uh, but our goal wasn't to be difficult. It was to do, do the best thing from a safety standpoint from that family, but it still was very hard pill to swallow for all of us. When you went out and did that, I think you were involved in part of that conversation, weren't you? 
that was. When you went out and did that and you walked back into the hospital, what were you feeling? Just absolutely empty inside. You know, because you're supposed to you're supposed to provide hope. You're supposed to provide support, not just for the patients, but their families as well. Uh, and when you're not allowed to let a family come in to spend the last few minutes of life with their loved one, um, they're never going to get that time back. You know, it's not something I can go back and fix on the back end. And nurses are fixers. Uh, <laughs> nurses, ER nurses especially, are are fixers from the standpoint that if the, the typical process doesn't work. The dead gummit, we're going to find a way to get something done, regardless of how it gets Always done. looking for a workaround. As long as it's in the best interest of the patient. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in this situation, there was no workaround. There was nothing we could do at that point uh, in that moment. Now, have we learned some lessons since then? Yes. Uh, we have a process now where our visitation, if there's any challenges to the rules, you know, it goes through uh, a specific administrator that can allow exemptions based on end-of-life situations, things like, and still be able to do it safely. Uh, I want to talk about the ER here, particularly Piedmont Columbus Regional's Midtown ER, which mm -hmm. is a level two trauma center, and you manage that uh, between COVID and just the regular run-of-the-mill stuff. And then we had 63 murders, 70 homicides in Columbus last year. A lot of those end up in your ER. A lot of those patients end up in your ER, whether they're into life or they're just, you know, they've been shot and y'all are trying to patch them back up. What has all that done to, to make your job more difficult? Because I'm, I'm going to assume it's made your job more difficult. So from a couple of standpoints, number one, um, there was a point early in the pandemic where overall ER volumes across the country just tanked because people were afraid of COVID. They didn't want to walk into a hospital and catch something. So people who would typically come to the ER for an aspirin or for a sprained ankle or, or things like that, they just didn't show up. So our numbers really kind of bottomed out. Um, it was, it was tough from a standpoint, from a business view, you know, you, the, the number of people you can staff to take care of everybody in the ER is based on how many people you see. And if people aren't coming, I'm going to have to start peeling back shifts for people that would need to work. Or so, shifting them to another part of the hospital. Correct. So, you know, all of that, that comes along with that. Um, it, it's made it tough from a volume and anticipating. Flip side of that, when Omicron first came out, I don't know what switch flipped the day after Christmas, but our volume is just exploded exploded overnight. The North Side ER went from seeing 80 to 100 patients a day to seeing 160 patients the next day. And they were working out of seven beds and two recliners just because of the construction project that was going on up there. So from a volume standpoint, uh, it's caused some, some challenges in managing that. Um, but, you know, whether it's, it's the gunshots, it's the trauma related to um, uh, car wrecks, things like that, uh, we still have to do that. Um, from the interpersonal violence standpoint, it infuriates our staff because we've got a culture now where it's okay to pull out a gun and, and settle your disagreements just by pulling a trigger a few times. Um, you know, society will have to deal with that. I can't fix that problem, but I'm still obligated it's to take your care of those it's patients. It's your problem. It I, becomes your problem. Correct, correct. And, and we have... Uh, uh, over the last several months, we've been working with a, with an organization locally that's getting started called Cure Violence. Cure Violence is a national organization that we're trying to charter a chapter here. But the idea behind so Cure Violence cool. is to, um, to basically curtail any uh, retaliatory uh, violence. You know, we can't always be there to stop somebody from pulling a trigger initially. But we can put boots on the ground in the EDs, uh, people who have been through interpersonal violence, people have been on the wrong side of that for a while that can now come in and be those eyes for you when you see somebody walk in a department waiting room. It's like these guys are probably here for not a good reason and help us not just to identify that, but also to have some conversations in the moment with family of someone who's been shot to say, hey, you know, going back and shooting who did this is not the right way to approach that. So, you know, this it's... It's still in the, you know, the preparatory phases here, 
uh, and I've got my fingers crossed that we can can put things together uh, to put something in there that will help us mis- mitigate some of those issues. Hope you can. I really hope you can. Um, I want to switch gears now. We're at the part of this podcast where I call it Turn the Tables. I've been asking you questions for 50 minutes. You get a shot. <laughs> Take your best shot, old sports guy. Take my best shot. Um, all right. Tell me about uh, the first TV news story that you covered and how you had to, to think outside the newspaper box to make that happen. may not have been the first, but it's one of the first. And Gene Kirkconnell was our news director, and I was so proud of myself. I had done this story. And it was a court uh, – it was – I can't remember exactly what it was. It had a lot of numbers, a lot of stuff in it. I went out there – Walked down this hallway. I read it on air, and this was the 5 o'clock show. I came back, man, my chest was puffed out. It's like, I did that. Gene looks at me and goes, that was a heck of a newspaper story. Now try to figure out how to make it a TV story before 6 o'clock. And I'm like, what? No. That was a great story. And that's been the part to me that, God, I hate to say this to I'm the journalist that used to call y'all TV bobos. Boy, was I an idiot. But this job is harder than the print side, and I know that's going to get me kicked out of the print union, but there ain't much left anyway. Um, But this job's harder. You've got to write tighter. You've got to write quicker. You've got to have pictures to illustrate it. You've got to convince people to go on camera that may or may not want to go on camera. I spent... 45 minutes an hour yesterday down at a gas station on uh, Old Casita Road and Far Road where they've had a number of shootings in the last uh, three weeks. You know, people are scared to death. They're not going to go on camera and put their face out there when there's a gang war going on. I mean, it's harder. It's a harder job. Mm -hmm. It's more rewarding at times. I mean, you know, and they expect me to turn original content every day. That's harder. I mean, this is a, you know, this is – a harder job but the best thing i ever did three years ago was move over here i mean somebody was taking care of me and and you're going to learn things like that along the way i did even after working in this market for i think i was i've been here about 10 years when i had the chance to finally go to work for one of the atlanta market stations um i was a part-time sports producer part-time news um uh, associate producer and the associate producer is just a glorified term for somebody that says, Hey, take this wire copy and create a story off of it. You know, um, I was raised back here without a whole lot of resources, uh, to take the, uh, the wire copy stuff. Uh, and that would be a 45 to one minute, something, something to put it together. Well, I wrote my first wire copy story for the Atlanta news and showed it to the produce, producer, uh, at the time. He said, hey, good job on this. He said, but it's got 15 seconds. Whittle it down to 15 seconds from 45. And and to be able to take a copy paper a foot long with all kinds of stuff in there, you still, what's the important stuff? In fact, I had a conversation with a a friend who's an uh, up-and-coming journalist uh, who's kind of dabbling in it right now and trying to to get a feel of whether he wants to do this for a career or not. Um, And... uh, he wrote a story that he ran by some folks, and, and I questioned him. I said, hey, you know, just because you get this from, quote, an official source, what value add is there for putting every single detail in your story? you got to think about that. What does it add to your story to say, you know, a statistic, a reference to a name, a thing like that? So I uh, had a good conversation, and I think this young man, if he continues on the path that he's on now, is going to turn into a pretty uh, pretty good reporter. Can't wait to see it. Um uh, we need good reporters. You know, and one thing we have now that you didn't have is we have the Internet. We have the ability to go online with deeper with deeper versions of things, and that's an incredible blessing. Well, we have overshot our time limit, which, but we're still under the hour. Um, we've reached the end of this edition of Chuck Williams' show. You can watch, and we we'll really want to thank Jack Rogers. Jack is Emergency Medical Services Director at Piedmont Columbus Regional. Uh came right out of this building into 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 bigger and better things 
Uh, this is the point I need to tell you. You can watch the Chuck Williams Show on Tuesday nights on WRBL.com from 7 to 8 p.m. You can also catch it on the podcast version on Spotify, iHeart, and Apple. Got them all right. Dylan Hansen, our director, he's, wow, that's only taken 45 shows to get that accurate. Okay, boy, the next 45 are going to be a winner. And then social media, Twitter, Chuck Will, at Chuck Williams. That's how long I've been on Twitter. There's no nothing there but Chuck Williams. We need a really famous Chuck Williams to come along, and I will sell Twitter as my retirement account. Facebook, Chuck Williams WRBL. And on Instagram, Chuck Williams 0999. Jack, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. I've always had great respect for you and your family. Your dad is one of the true public servants of our community. So I really, and you have followed clearly in his footsteps. Um, I thank you for coming and spending time. And if you want to hear more from Jack, we're going to have him as a guest on our Sunday conversation, which you'll be able to see on WRBL on the News 3 Sunday morning coming up this week. Jack, thanks for being here. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Chuck Williams Show.